what does it mean to be an entrepreneurial learner? This does not mean how to become an entrepreneur. This really means how do you constantly look around you all the time for new ways, new resources to learn new things. That's the sense of entrepreneur I'm talking about that now in the network age almost gives us unlimited possibility. Entrepreneurial learners are basically fundamentally makers and tinkerers. We tend to underplay just how important this is. And so I think that as we move into the 21st century, we have to completely rethink the workscape as a learning scape. We have to find ways that each of us get more talented by working. Just being able to learn as individuals is not enough. The real question is, how do we start to scale these types of learning systems that we all come here to talk about? It's really, how do we take these technologies and invent new types of institutional forms, new types of social practices, and in fact, new types of skills to be able to leverage the capabilities of the technology. The technology is the easy part. The hard part is what are the social practices around this and also the institutional structures. We've got to ask ourselves, what will the institutions of schooling, universities, research universities actually look like five or ten years from now? And if they look the same as they do now, we've got problems. You can now expect the half-life of a skill, most skills we pick up, to have about five years. You really have now moving from a 20th century notion of looking at how do you pick up a set of fixed assets that are authoritative, transfer to you in delivery models, often called schooling, that have wonderful scalable efficiency because we can talk to 100 people or 100,000 people basically simultaneously. How do we move from that transfer model to the model of how do you participate on the ever-moving flows of activities, knowledge, and so on and so forth? How do you move from being like a steamship that sets course and keeps going for a long time to what you might call whitewater kayaking, that you have to be in the flow and you have to be able to pick things up on the moment. You gotta feel it with your body. You gotta be a part of that. You gotta be in it, not just above it and learning about it. Let's step back a moment. Look at the heroes, at least my heroes, back 75 years ago or so, that really drove a phenomenal movement in education. Maria Montessori and John Dewey. Perhaps they were 75 years ahead of their time. Perhaps their intuitions were right, but their tool set was wrong. Maybe, just maybe, they can now. Let's look at some examples and see even how many of the Montessori ideas, for example, could be recast in the network age that might provide us a way to create what I might call an arc of life learning that scales. Because of the networked age, now there are over 6,000 communities of interest that have been created around Harry Potter. There are thousands of discussion forums. There are, in some ways, 386,000 stories that have now been written. But perhaps more surprising to me is there are equivalent to at least I would say a hundred, maybe more, equivalent of 400 page novels have been written by kids joining this Harry Potter movement. Writing is back, writing is here in a major way, and we have the tools and the social networking to incite and to incent uh, people to do amazing pieces of work. Knowledge production and knowledge dissemination is happening at an unbelievable rate. In fact, if you think about the social life around the edge of the game, I'm not arguing that the World of Warcraft as a game is all that important. I'm arguing that the social life around the edge of the game, the learning ecologies, the knowledge ecologies being created on the fly as emergent properties of playing this game better and better, created by the kids themselves, is something we ought to understand. The social dynamics of that is very, very important. You look at these, the infrastructure being created to support the videos, the forums, uh, the wikis, the blogs. How does this work? I mean, how can 12,000, 14, 15,000 new ideas a night be processed? And what I find so beautiful about the social life around uh, the edge of World of Warcraft, these kids craft their own dashboards in order to measure 
their own performance and to amplify their ability to learn new skills more rapidly than anybody else. How do we begin to look at ways to combine Homo sapiens, man as knower, uh, with Homo faber, man as maker? We've always thought about Homo faber as man as maker, maker of things, maker of content, but the game has just changed. Now, today, in the network age, with the tools we have at our disposal, we can now not only make things, but we can make contexts. It used to be that basically contexts were stable and recognize the fact that meaning often emerges as much from context as content. And we can start to create contexts, then we have a whole new dimension for creating meaning. But you know, it's also considered blogging. You know, blogging is, in fact, in a very interesting way, constructing a context as much as content. I'm very struck by Andy Sullivan, and he wrote a beautiful article on why I blog in Atlantic Monthly. Let me just kind of read a little bit of it. From his point of view, blogging is something that engages what I would call joint context creation. The blogger, as he said, the blogger is more than any writer of the past, a node among other nodes, connected but unfinished, without the links and the comments and the trackbacks that make the blogosphere at its best, a conversation rather than a production. A beautiful new book by David Weinberg, Too Big to Know. Think about that a moment. We used to know how to know. We got our answers from books or experts. We nailed down the facts and moved on. We, after all, had cannons. But in the internet age, knowledge has moved on to networks. There's more knowledge than ever, but it's different. Topics have no boundaries, and nobody agrees on anything. We, as learners, need new strategies and new tools for this world. In a world of constant change, entrepreneurial learners must also be willing to regrind their conceptual lenses. How do you rebuild a conceptual lens? Our argument is play. Play is the essential thing. Now, a key aspect of play is not that subtle. It's kind of a permission to fail, fail, fail again and get it right. Think of extreme sports. Failure is a critical part of that learning. But also think about the play of imagination in writing poetry. How do you kind of tinker with a phrase, trying one phrase after another phrase after another phrase to get that phrase just right? And perhaps most importantly, you think about an epiphany. How do you play with something until something just falls in place? Because if we can create one epiphany for one child, that epiphany lasts for life for that kid. Brilliant teachers are brilliant in being able to create epiphanies for kids. How do we think about that? And how do we use play as a way to amplify the chance for that to happen? Tinkering is, is catalytic to many kids as a way to kind of understand the moves that are possible. Now, the reason I bring up tinkering in particular is in a world of constant change, if you don't feel comfortable tinkering, you're going to feel an amazing state of anxiety. So I want to suggest that the world we're actually moving into and the tools that we want to build, the institutions we want to create, the different types of connections we want to make, the different types of institutions that already make up our context and maybe make some new institutions, really says, how do we get a more balanced structure between knowing, making, and playing? Homo sapiens, homo faber, homo ludens. And think about this in terms of riddling and world building. How do you actually start to kind of build new worlds with the network tools that we actually have, which is the deepest kind of tinkering? The real game that we have today in this networked age is new notions of networks and imagination. How do we amplify our ability through kind of emergent collective action? But the key part of play is a space of safety and permission. What kinds of permission? do we give our students today? What kinds of permission are required for the tools we're talking about to really have their power? And what types of institutional innovations do we need to think about 
that grant those types of permissions in order to be playful in this deep epistemological sense. So I think we're finding fundamentally new ways to bring about change is really now looking much more carefully in how you build webs of connections outside that actually become so powerful that it actually starts to change people in the core, not through terror, not through push, but through seduction and pull. Some of the greatest learning environments were actually the one-room schoolhouse. Why were they so effective? It's because the teacher wasn't transferring knowledge, but the teacher was acting as a coach, a coordinator, a mentor, that getting older kids to spend some time helping younger kids. So the older kids were teaching the younger kids, and then the younger kids would turn around and also teach the younger, younger kids. It was an amazing social dynamic in that classroom. And the teacher was responsible for orchestrating that amazing ability to learn and to teach simultaneously by each student in that class. Let us ask, is it possible we're getting a position to take the one-room schoolhouse and make it the global one-room schoolhouse through these networks of imagination and new forms of mentorship?